and then once again. We have uh, quite a number of questions from different people and uh, I guess to be able to answer them all, we need to answer them a bit more quickly. It depends. Um, but in case uh, if one answers the question, and if you have any other comments, I'd like the mic or Brian to follow up. So, anyways, probably uh, we'll start with the doctor. <laughs> Dr. Mike. Okay, we, <clears throat> since the questions were submitted in advance, I have a little time to prepare some kind of response here. So that's, uh, in one case, they uh, asked for a specific length of response, so I had to write it out to make sure it was the right length. Uh, anyway, the first, first question here. If understanding the Trinitarian nature of God is not required for salvation, then what is the significance of learning Trinitarian theology? Well, it's true, we don't have to understand Trinitarian theology in order to be saved. We don't need any theology at all, really. Uh, if, if all you want to get out of Christianity is salvation for yourself, then you know, theology is not very important. Uh, it might be like somebody who wanted to get married for the money. Uh, for example, a woman who says, uh, I don't care what kind of person he is, just as long as he gives me the money he wants. You know, it's not a very good basis for a relationship. Uh, You'd think that a person who wanted to get married would want to get to know the person she would spend the rest of her life with. And the same goes for our relationship with God. If we're going to spend the rest of our lives with God, it makes sense we'd like to get to know Him a little bit. And that's theology. Suppose we get to the Day of Judgment and God says in this big booming voice, I am glad you're here. You're welcome to come into my kingdom and live forever with me. And a person says, well, I don't, want to, I don't know if I want to commit quite that long. Uh, I'm not sure if I want to be with you forever. You are that big unknown, and I'm afraid of you. Uh, and God says, afraid? Not sure? Well, that's a lack of trust and lack of belief. Fail of send that person to outer darkness. <laughs> Uh, no, it's got, it's got, it's got to be like that. You know, I don't think so. If we have any opinions about that at all, then we have a theology. We have some concept of God, what He's like. Everybody has a theology, uh, whether we call it by that word or not. We have some, have some concept of God. Sometimes our ideas are wrong, and sometimes they're a little closer to right. Uh, but in all cases, it's you know, some kind of uh, idea about it. So if we want salvation, and we understand that salvation means living forever with God, we're also going to want to know at least a little bit about what He's like. Uh, and I'm convinced that if we learn more about the God who has given us salvation, then we'll also learn something about His nature, His Trinitarian nature. For example, Jesus couldn't save us and forgive us unless He's God. And he tells us about the Father, that he's in perfect agreement with the Father, and that the Father loved Jesus even before the world began. And he tells us about the Holy Spirit transforming us, and that's part of our salvation too. Uh, whatever the Son does, that God is doing. Whatever the Spirit does, God is doing. Uh, and yet Jesus tells us there's only one God. So there's a fundamental unity in the ways in which we know about the God who's giving us salvation. And Trinitarian theology is a, kind of an attempt to understand a little bit more about what Jesus is revealing to us. And we don't need to know all this before we get started, before our name is put into the book of life. But, but when we start learning more about the God who is saving us and the God with whom we'll be spending eternity, then I'll think we'll, we'll learn that God is three and yet one. He, he loves us in the same way that the Father loved Jesus before the foundation of the world. And the more we learn about God, the more that we will want to spend eternity with Him. And you know, Trinitarian theology isn't a prerequisite for salvation, but it comes from a desire in us after we're saved. Uh, we, we simply want to know more about God. Uh, and as we learn more about God, we also learn about how the Father and the Son are distinct persons and yet also one being. We don't have to know the details of how this works, and in some way, we can't. It's 
beyond our ability of us finite people to know how uh, the infinite spirit life is like. But we can take what God has revealed to us and try to understand it as best we can. Some people understand the, the, the data that he's given to us in a non-Trinitarian way, but throughout the years, most people who have studied it have come to a Trinitarian understanding, that that's the best that we have. Uh, and not only is it the best, it's also an encouraging picture. That, that, to me, it helps us understand God's love for us and why we need salvation in the first place. And the picture of what will be like in salvation and eternity. So I've got more than I needed to <laughs> I think I'll probably uh, follow it up because the next question is kind of connected to it, so I can answer more uh, quickly. Uh, the question is uh, I understand that salvation is a one time event by believing Jesus as our Savior. I also understand that sanctification or growing in Christ or becoming Christ like is a continuous process then, if that being the case, do I really need sanctification? Can I just not have salvation and just wait for Christ's return? So, um, this is a minimalist you know, perspective on Christianity, trying to find the least, uh, the most minimum requirement. And since Jesus already has given us salvation, why do we need to have sanctification? Kind of follow up uh, to what uh, Dr. Mike was saying, and that is salvation is more than just being saved or being made guiltless. The scriptures, the Bible talks about the relationship that God offers. I mean, Christ comes knocking on the door, behold, he opens the door, Christ will come in and will eat with us. It talks about this ongoing relationship. It's not just being saved. And then that's it, you know, being made guiltless, but it's an ongoing day-by-day -day relationship. Um, it's like, uh, you know, Jewel, my uh, niece, gave birth to a daughter, a baby, the other day. Um, so it's like, it's like us, okay, being born of God. Now, Jewel can reason, okay, saves the baby. By the way, I'm making this already an announcement. I <laughs> Since uh, Sarah Victoria was like five pounds and a few more inches, uh, since she's already born, my job is done. I don't have to do anything. So, Juno cannot just think about that, just do nothing, because that's just the beginning, you know, the, the being born aspect. And, and so she needs a lot of nurturing, a lot of love, the relationship between Sarah, Victoria, and Ava, and the parents, Jim and Jewel, continues on. You know, there's that beautiful, ongoing relationship that must continue. And that is all part of uh, what the gospel is about. It's not just being made guiltless, but it's about our ongoing, beautiful relationship uh, with God. That's, to me, is what makes life more beautiful. It's like when I married my wife, I didn't say, ha ha, I got my marriage contract, now I can leave her. <laughs> she can be on her, no, no, no. Marriage is about my life with my wife. I guess I kind of miss her, right? <laughs> I'm feeling lonely. <laughs> so it's my relationship with my wife day and day and, and the growth of that love, that's what it is. That's what marriage is, that's just that beginning contract. So... Um, that's kind of connected. Amen. <laughs> All right. Uh, so here's the question, actually. I'm prefacing it because they asked to have it done this way. So do I really need to be aware on the small stuff or every small thing or just concentrate on the big things in life? And so, for example, small sins versus uh, big sins. And then they give specific example of the, you know, to, what to talk about. Being annoyed at my kids, uh, coworkers, or angry with my neighbors versus uh, not cheating on taxes or having an extramarital affair. So I would say this. Um, first of all, sin is sin. Is sin. Um, the Bible really doesn't make a distinction between a small sin and a big sin. Uh, sin is anything that goes against God, 
God's laws, which are in place to keep us in harmony with Him and, and with each other. And God's law under the new covenant comprises loving God and with all our heart, mind, and soul, and then loving one another. So, therefore, you know, like being annoyed at my kids or coworkers or being angry with our neighbors, not necessarily a sin, okay? The question in these circumstances for us should be, is the basis of my actions towards my children the result of a behavior that my child is exhibiting that needs to change? Or is the action that I am taking by ignoring my child going to help my child to have a good behavior, have a good behavior? Or am I acting in a way that provokes my child to anger? Because we know, as it says in Ephesians, that do not provoke your ch children to anger. So, um, and then same way, like being annoyed with uh, your coworker is exhibiting. Well, it can be can be good if it helps. If what you're annoyed about the person is actually like it's taking away time from work and it's not helping for worker productivity. So. Maybe you're ignore, annoying them. Being annoyed will help them to focus on, oh, I, I need to, I need to really focus my attention on, on my neighbor, you know, on, on, on my work that I have to do. So, um, but now here's the thing: uh, cheating on taxes is definitely a sin, okay? Because it's a form of lying. You know, we're writing something down on paper that's not true, and we're misrepresenting and falsifying information. So. And then having an extramarital affair, that's against God, completely against God's nature, His plan. You know, God asked for us to be married to one woman, and for those who are not married, that we're not to have sex outside of marriage. It says in Hebrews, we're not supposed to do that. So having an extramarital affair is definitely a, a no-no. But I would say this, in answering that question, you know, uh, God is interested in our heart. Okay, and, you know, Jesus said in Matthew, the fifth chapter, five through seven, we talked about uh, the Beatitudes. You know, he said, like, if you look upon a woman to lust after her, you have sinned in your heart. So it's like God takes us to a deeper level. Uh, do we sweat the small stuff, meaning the little sins? Oh, look, sin, like I said, it's sin. So we just need to be aware of who we are in Christ. And, you know, Jesus was always very angry at the Pharisees because they, they did all these little things that were like the law that they had, but then their hearts were evil. So, you know, we should want to be like Jesus. And it's like once we have Jesus in our hearts, we accept him, we love him. He is in, our, in us, and we're going to want to serve him, and we're going to want to love him, and we're not going to want to sin. Another question about the Trinity. So it's in five minutes. How can I explain the Trinity to a Christian? So set your stopwatch here. <laughs> uh, we could start with John 1 1, which says that the Word was God. Down in verse 14, it said the Word became flesh, lived among us. That, that was Jesus. Uh, yet verse 1 says that the Word was God. Verse 3 says he was the creator of everything. Jesus came to reveal the Father, and he prayed to the Father. He said that the Father is God. So Jesus is God, and the Father is God. But how many gods do we have? Uh, Jesus said there's only one God. Isaiah 43, at verses 10 and 11 says, I alone am God. There is no other God. Never has been, never will be. I, yes, I am the Lord. There is no other Savior. So here's God speaking in the singular. I me, uh, saying that there's only one Savior, yet the New Testament calls Jesus the Savior, calls the Father the Savior. So how many Saviors are there? Well, the Bible gives us two names, but insists that there's only one God, only one Savior. There's not some committee of gods. Uh, this God speaks in the singular. So we've got plurality and unity. And that was a problem in the early church. The pagans looked at them and said, you guys worship two gods. And the Christians replied, well, no, there's only one God. So they tried to explain it in different ways. Uh, one church leader, he threw the Father out, and so the church said, no, that's not right. Another guy said that, well, Jesus was some sort of lesser God. 
some sort of created being, but the most of the church said, well, no, that's not right either. We don't worship a created being. So their idea went everything against the Greek philosophers had said, it went everything against the Jews had said. Nobody ever had this concept before, and so they didn't have the right kind of terminology uh, to speak about it. They had to search around for some words, and they gave them new definitions to fit the situation. So they had two somethings in one thing. Uh, they couldn't say that there were two beings in one being, that would be kind of self-contradictory. They had to pick a different word. And eventually they came up with what's now translated in, in, into English as persons. The Father and the Son are two persons in one God being. They're not persons in the same way that humans are persons, of course, uh, but they're persons in the way that spirits can be. We don't know exactly what that is, but that's the biblical data. You know, that the Father is God, the Son is God, but there's only one God. So we have to resolve it some way, and to use some word for it, and so we use the word persons. And then once they realized that they had that explanation for the Father and the Son, they realized the Holy Spirit fits into it in the same way. Our experience of salvation is with the Father, Son, and with the Holy Spirit. In Acts 5, Ananias, or Peter said that Ananias lied to the Holy Spirit, and in the next breath he says that he lied to God. Uh, whatever the Spirit does, God does. And the Spirit also seems to be distinct from the Father and the Son, and yet also God. So we have three persons in one God being. And that's the doctrine of the Trinity. Is that five minutes? Three minutes. <laughs> oh, wow. Good. All right, I have time for another minute. <laughs> <laughs> now, we receive all kinds of questions, so to be fair, we need to you know, address as many as we can. Uh, one of the questions that's asked here is, uh, I guess this one person likes prophecy. How do you prepare for the zombie apocalypse? <laughs> Dean, did you ask that question? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Anthony. Well, you need to have a strong heart. <laughs> so you run fast. You know? uh, because zombies don't run fast. <laughs> uh, you need to know how to act like them so you can hide. Uh, of course, Johnny has hide. <laughs> It's probably a joke, right? Because <laughs> I don't recall anything in the Bible where there's a zombie. I know one, you know, Jesus rose, one who died and came back to life. But that is life, not zombie. Lazarus. Lazarus was not a zombie, right? <laughs> but anyways, that's just being lighthearted, I guess. Uh, um, well, one question here is, uh, when does the Holy Spirit indwell in a person when he believes, when he's baptized, before he believes, or when what? So it's a question. Um, I think probably sometimes when we read questions like this, it's challenging to answer because we figure, okay, what is the reason behind the question? Because, uh, you know, there's another theology where people embrace called the universalism. And one of the thing, teaching they have is uh, because the Holy Spirit is everywhere, Christ has you know, died for all humanity and all, all of that, so the Holy Spirit is only present, so therefore the Holy Spirit is already indwelling in people. Um, I think we need to differentiate between presence, you know, by nature, God is everywhere. You agree, right? God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. But then there is also the aspect of relational. The relational aspect there. Um, where, I mean the question shouldn't be probably this one, but more of uh, our response to God's invitation for a relationship. God is everywhere. Uh, God may be, you know, here, but we may not have a relationship with Him. And we see a plenty in the scriptures where God invites people in a relationship with Him. And so how do we respond? Now, a good scripture, we can just use one scripture. In Acts 2 verse 38, which is a part of Peter's sermon, where Peter said, Repent, 
and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So here we see the response of people to the Holy Spirit. And because of their response in faith, repentance, and this what he's saying here, because of that response to God, God develops and connects with us in a relationship. The indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in a relational way. So then that is what makes Christians different from the rest of the world because we have relationship with the Holy Spirit, with the Father, with the Son, you know, through the Holy Spirit. So there's a difference between the omnipresence nature of God and also the relational aspect. So the question we ask is, what about you? How is your relationship with God? Have you responded to His invitation? So I think that's the question. Okay, uh, going back to the second part of the question that I uh, addressed at first, there's another example. So for example, uh, small sin versus big sin. So here's another example. So being lazy versus uh, you know, being unforgiving. Okay, so um, now, laziness is unique. I call it a habit. It's a, it's a habit, it's a characteristic that's not good, but uh, <laughs> it's, I don't see it as necessarily itself a sin to be lazy, but it's not a good thing as well, <laughs> okay? Um, you know, laziness, it carries over to other parts of our lives. So basically, if we're lazy in one area, and especially, you know, it's like we, we're really casual, we just kind of like, ah, I'll do it later, it's just like, it's kind of la uh, haphazard, lackadaisical, not really, you know, diligent. And the Bible encourages us to be diligent. And so if, if we're diligent in the small things, we'll be diligent in the big things. So it's, it's, a, it's a habit that's not good because it can lead to sin. Okay, um, and also, um, it also helps us, as we're diligent, it, you know, it gives us the ability to have more of a clear conscience a lot of times, because uh, that's what happens. Um, um, and also, I can just say this, um, forgiveness is, it's commanded by God. God tells us to forgive those who, uh, who do wrong against us, those who hurt us, and those who speak evil against us. He asks us to forgive them. And it's, to me, it's such an important part of God's, the way God is, because God has forgiven us already. He has already forgiven us in Christ. He's forgiven every single one of us. He's even forgiven the world. Through Christ, he's, he's, He has that mindset, that attitude. So this, if, if we can have that, the attitude of forgiveness, then we're having the mind of Jesus, that we're having the mind of Christ by having that kind of an attitude. So, um... And God says right there in Scripture that if we don't learn to forgive our neighbors, then He won't forgive us. So that it is something that we just we need to do. We need to have a forgiving attitude. And um, also, you know, um, as that being bound up in the heart of God, we want to be more and more like God. You know, it says in Romans three twenty three, it says, "For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God." So there, there's no, there's none of us are guiltless. We're all guilty. Yet, God has forgiven us. And then it says in Romans 6, 23, uh, that for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So all God really wants us to do is just receive Jesus and just enjoy the relationship and live in Christ. And he will live in us. And that was Jesus' prayer in John 17. That we would just, this wonderful relationship. And I just want to say one more thing too. Because I've, I've been learning some things too. Like I know, I, it took me a while to figure it out. But you know, there are places in the Bible where he talks about, you know, this transaction. You know, that when, when Jesus when Jesus died, there was this transaction. And, we, and you know, he purchased us. And it's true. He did purchase us. But it's more than that. This is this relationship that he wants to have. He just wants so much to have 
this relationship with us, and us to just like be in harmony with Him, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. So that's that's the beauty about. I'm just adding to your <laughs> Trinitarian theology. <laughs> That, that was the one minute I didn't hear. I didn't hear. <laughs> uh, a different subject here. It says, uh, I read the creation account in Genesis and interpret it literally as seven 24-hour days. But some people don't interpret it that way. What's the GCI belief on this? How long is God's creation of heaven and earth? GCI doesn't have a position on this. There are some articles on our website explaining that Genesis 1 doesn't have to be interpreted literally. There are some details in Genesis 1 that kind of make it difficult to interpret everything literally. Uh, for example, uh, there's some sort of firmament or vault in, in the sky, and there are stars that are in the firmament, but there's water above the firmament. firmament. And I don't think that works as a literal description. And it says that God made the sun and the moon on day four, but there was already light on day one. Uh, it's generally explained that the creation of this account is written from a, the perspective of someone on earth. And God simply made the sun visible on day four when it was really created earlier. It's a figure of speech. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that the days have to be interpreted as a figure of speech as well. Uh, maybe they are, maybe they aren't. GCI's position is that you don't have to take them literally. You're free to use other evidence. You can use the evidence that God has given us in the natural world. Some people think that scientific evidence points to a recent creation, a quick creation. Other people say that scientific evidence points to a, an ancient and a gradual creation. So GCI says, well, you can look at the evidence and come to your own conclusion. It's, this is a matter on which there can be different views. It, it doesn't affect the gospel that we preach or the way we live. Uh, the fact that God is our creator is much more important than the details of how fast he created or what the exact literary style of Genesis is. Uh, people who hold one view shouldn't uh, look down on those who hold the other view. It's not an essential part of Christianity, whereas love for one another is. Uh, let me just uh, add to what uh, Brian said a while ago. He um, mentioned about what Christ has done for us, is that he has already forgiven, past tense, right? Forgiven humanity's sin. Uh, Christ came to save the world, John 3.16, for God so loved the world. And then verse 17 it says, for God didn't send his son to condemn the world, but to save it. So when Christ came and has given us the forgiveness, sometimes people may misunderstand that and use that as an excuse for not doing anything anymore, right? Um, what is the role? What comes after that? Uh, so people would say, so therefore you understand what your grace is, so therefore now I can sin. Do anything I want because my sins are forgiven, past, present, future, and all of that. Because again, our thinking of you know, salvation and being saved has always been of that being made guiltless. Yet when we look at the entire scope of the scripture, that's just beginning, and salvation means a lot more. It's not just being born again, or being born in the kingdom of God. If you look at the story of the parable of the uh, prodigal son, the father gave birth to the son, right? So it was not the choice of the son. The father gave birth, and he's already the son. So through Jesus Christ, we became children of God, children of God. But the son in that story, the response was far from what is right, and that is to disobedience, to rebellion. He ran away from the father. Okay? Did the father make you know, uh, made that possible that he is the son? Yes. So God has done by grace his love, his, his grace. He has done his part. But the response of the son to God's grace has put him in a hellish condition, 
where he was eating, uh, they will not even give him food for the pigs. You know, he was even asking, can you give me the food for the pigs? And they won't even give him that because in that particular culture, especially the Jewish culture, anything in relationship to pigs is you're really way, 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 way down the bottom. And so he was way, way down below the pigs because he was not even given food for the pigs. So there's this huge contrast that I think the, the story is really showing to us that when we go against God and run away from that gift, God has not taken away the choice. That's what happens. It's going to be really, really bad. And when the son ran away from his father, did he become fatherless? No. Did he become not son? No, he was still the son. No matter what he did, he was still the son. That is never removed. Was the child homeless? Uh, from his perspective, he was homeless. But from the perspective of the father, who has already gave him birth, you know, the family of son, and who loves him unconditionally, from the father, he is not homeless. He has a home. So in relationship with us, with God, God has done His part. Through Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Through Jesus Christ, we are saved. How do we respond to that? So if we respond in rebellion, and then we are thrown in a hellish condition, it's not God's fault. It is our fault. When we cut off our relationship from God, then we suffer. It's our fault. So that's how, you know, how uh, that is, uh, we are forgiven, but then we can rebel, you know, and we suffer because of that. Uh, the qu a quick question here is that of uh, um, how can, what can we do to help new life right now? I like that because I'm the pastor here. I like people asking, what can we do <laughs> to help? You like it. Well, as in, in most cases, uh, in the church, the Bible talks about giftedness. God says in Romans, 1 Corinthians 12, that God has given each Christian certain gifts. Not only spiritual gifts, but He has given us personality, He has given us our own experience, relationships, and all of that. And God wants us to use those gifts in service to the Lord. So we begin with that question, we organize. How do we organize ministries in the church? We organize by spiritual giftedness. So we ask ourselves, what are the gifts that God has given you? The gifts are not for you to edify yourself or myself. The gifts are to edify the body. So what gifts has God given you? And those are the ones that you use to serve the body of Christ. Sometimes it's not even the gifts, it's above the gifts. Sometimes it's also a sacrifice. Sometimes even if we feel like we don't have a gift, but there is a need for it, we step out of the boat, go into uncomfortable situation, and do it anyway, because we love the Lord. So there are many needs here, as I was mentioning a while ago in the church, and go by your giftedness, by your own talent. Your talents are God's gift to you. Use them to serve the Lord. Yeah. <clears throat> Here's another question, uh, and it's again, it's on the same line of what I was talking about. Do, do I need to be aware of the small stuff? For every small thing, you just concentrate on the big things. Okay. So, for example, good works, and we we're just talking about good works, um, small good works versus big good works. Okay. Um, and here's example, like for example, at home, being clean. Cleaning my surroundings versus supporting missions or going into missions. Okay, so I would say this: the Bible really doesn't distinguish between small good works and and big good works. I know I could say the same thing, but it's just like it really doesn't do that. But Jesus said that you know He who is greatest among you is your servant. So it's just the attitude of having wanting to be a servant in everything. And so with this in mind. Good works involve everything um, that we do. So if we like open the door for someone uh, or pick up trash, you know, I mean, with no, with no one asking us, 
we're just doing it out of kindness of our heart. God looks at this. You know, Jesus uh, said that if you give someone a cup of water, it's as if you give it to Jesus. And it's, it, he will remember that. God will remember that. And so he, he wants us to be filled with <clears throat> good works. And um, I like to think of this as a lifestyle. I, I just think the longer we're being, we are Christians, if we're growing in Christ, we are actually, it's becoming our lifestyle to want to have, to want to give and want to, you know, serve. It's just because part of who we are, our nature, more and more and more. I know we still have the flesh that we battle with, but, you know, the more we're with Jesus and the more we really have that relationship with him, we, we want to have this attitude of giving and this attitude of, of sharing in this way. And so um, Jesus, you know, he loves everyone. And here's the thing, okay, I want to give you an example. You know, Jesus loves all people, especially those poor and destitute. So we have the question about, well, how about in cleanliness and things at our house? And personally, I don't consider that, I mean, a good work. I mean, what I mean is, it's good that you keep clean. It's good that we keep organized. It's good that our house looks nice. But I, I don't, <laughs> we just do that because we want to do that. You know, it, I, I think if it's directed at someone else and it's there to serve and help somebody else, then then it's a good work. But um, but I don't, I don't, I myself don't see it as a good work because we naturally. And then think about this, everyone. What if you're very poor? What if you are homeless on the street? What if you don't have anything? I mean, and so you smell terrible, you look terrible, you don't have anything to organize. You see what I'm saying? I mean, it's like Jesus loves everybody. He loves every single one of us, and he loves the poor and the destitute. He loves everyone. So I don't see just being clean and all the stuff that's directly, you know, good works. <laughs> you know, if it's, if it's to help direct to help someone else and serve someone without them asking, for sure, it's, it's a good work. So, um, these things, I just believe that being clean, cleaning in my surroundings versus supporting missions, they, 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 they should work together. Um, God loves those people who have a heart for serving. And, you know, Abraham was a missionary. You know, I mean, God told him to go somewhere and he just, he just did it. He went. He did whatever God said. So, but I say this, look at where we are, where you are, where you live, where I live as a place of missionary work. Because <laughs> there's a need out there. And it really is. Um, we need people that want to show other people the way of Jesus in their neighborhood, where they live. So that, that's how I see missionary work. It's a beautiful thing. And that's, that's my answer to that question. And it made me think, you know, the common idea is that people think, well, we are, our response should be like Isaiah. Here I am, send me. And God says, go home. <laughs> well, he just sent you. And he gave you a job. You know, according to your spiritual gifts, serve where he places you. Uh, here's, here's a different question. Uh, is the GCI complementarian or egalitarian? And most people say, say what? <laughs> This refers to the question of whether women are, 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 are ordained. <laughs> uh, complementarian refers to the idea that men and women are complementary, uh, that they have different strengths and they should work together. Egalitarian refers to the idea that men and women are equal. Uh, and labels are sometimes useful, but there can also be a nuisance as well. In this case, the labels don't work very well because um, complementarians also believe in equality and egalitarians also believe in complementarity. <laughs> so, I guess, and, and, and people in one category can have a whole range of views. Some of them are uh, extreme one way, some are extreme the other way, and of course, we, we, our view is never extreme. You know, we, we are the standard by which everything else is judged. <laughs> and we're always moderate. Uh, <laughs> so, the question is, does GCI ordain women? That's kind of what it boils down to, and the answer is yes. <laughs> so, and there's, uh, uh, you know, 120 pages uh, study document on a website explaining why that's so and how the Bible does not. The verses in the Bible that seem to restrict that were written for a restricted situation. Uh, 
so you'll, it's a long, difficult subject, so I refer you to that for more information. Yeah, because um, people can be an extreme of being complementarian or egalitarian. Uh, some people are uh, complementarian because they believe, because of what Paul says, women are not supposed to speak in the church. So they use that a lot, one of their main, main scriptures, and forbid you know, women from speaking. But both sides, they both quote scriptures. That's the thing. Both have scriptures to prove their point. Both have the scriptures. Uh, from my simple way of looking at it, I look at it again, as I mentioned a while ago, by giftedness. If God gave us certain tools or gifts, you know, gifts, spiritual gifts are like tools. If gave God, gave us, God gave us gifts, then they're meant to be used. And I know a lot of women who have the certain gifts, gifts that are, uh, that some men don't have. Like even with my, my wife and myself, I know the Bible says, complementarian, I am the head of the family. I mean, that's what it says, right? But there are certain things that my wife has strength that I don't have. And I don't want to force myself in doing that's where, where I am weak. I defer to my wife with that particular strength, like budgeting, you know? Certain things, I don't like to do all that administrative budgeting where I defer to her. And she defers to me, you know, I like cooking. You know, although that sounds like feminine. But <laughs> so we, we defer and, and none of us feel like we are usurping ranks and power. You know, we are all Christians and we respect each other and we respect each other's strength and we respect each other's weakness. So I think even in the body, we understand that when we look from Genesis to Revelation, we see God using women as in Deborah the prophet, as in Esther, we see women doing work that men should be, quote unquote, doing. So, you know, my is right, uh, labeling things are complicating things, so we don't look at it label-wise, but we look at it from the perspective of uh, God is in charge and He gives us through His Holy Spirit certain strength, and then we capitalize on, on those strengths. A uh, quick question here. We just related to a previous one. What is the place of signs, wonders, gifts in the church today, like speaking in tongues, prophecy, words of knowledge and wisdom, miracles, instantaneous healings, and so forth? Uh, you know, again, relating to giftedness, First Corinthians chapter twelve, verses three up to you know sixteen. Um, all of this, when Scripture talk about giftedness. Uh, they are to be used for the edification of the body. It's for others, for the build-up of humanity. That's what they are. So, what is the place of healings and all of this? All of these are gifts. But the Bible does say that not everyone has all the gifts. God gives varying gifts. So, we defer to a person with the gift of preaching or teaching on that aspect of work, or a gift of administration, or a gift of miracles, and you know, all of that. So, but they all have a place, a place in the body of Christ. Um, and nobody can claim, my gift is better than yours. Or say, I have this gift, so I'm more righteous than yours. Which sometimes people use with other gifts. So, that's my answer. Um, to that question, yes. Okay. All right, I'm gonna, my last question. <clears throat> Still on the same vein of big stuff, small stuff. Um, so being grateful, thankful, versus praying and reading the Bible every day, so. All right, so, um, to me, the matter of being grateful and thankful versus praying and reading the Bible, for me, it's a matter of equal importance, and let me explain, <laughs> okay. Um, God wants us to be grateful for what Jesus Christ has done. He died for us, and, you know, and he, he, he has given us eternal life. And the attitude of gratefulness and thankfulness, it lends us to wanting to praise God, wanting to give God glory and to just, just, just laud Him with all glory and honor and praise. It's part of 
the nature of who God is, and He wants us to that to be part of it. So I see this all working together. And like when we pray, basically a lot of times we give thanks to God for all the wonderful blessings, for all the good things that He's done, and how He's helped us, and He shares, and He loves, and He gives. So. It's really important to be grateful and thankful, and it's really important to pray and study. They're, they're both really, really important. So um, the Holy Spirit, he, he brings to our remembrance uh, the things that we need. And so when we, when we talk to God, you know, the Holy Spirit is, is working on our behalf. And, and Jesus is as well. You know, he says in, in uh, 1 John that he's our advocate. He's there always. there defending us. You know, and so the relationship that we have to God and with God through reading the Bible. I mean, when, when we read the Bible, it's like, you know, God's just like speaking to us. He's talking to us through the scripture. But the Holy Spirit, and I think this is important, the Holy Spirit is going to bring us into the things that we need when we're talking with God, when we're reading the Bible, you see. And so it's like, I say, don't forget God. <laughs> When you read the Bible, I mean, remember that it is God who's inspiring and it's Him who's doing it. Because I, you know, there's a scripture that Jesus said in the New Testament. He said that to the, I guess they were Pharisees or whatever. He says, you, you, you read the scriptures because you think you have eternal life. But you don't come to me for the life, the real life, which is eternal life. So God has given His word. The Holy Spirit has you know, it just fills us with the thoughts of God. So through lots of uh, reading, the Holy Spirit brings to our remembrance and teaches us what we need to learn for the day. And then when we pray, we're sharing with God what's on our heart, and that's what He wants. And whatever it is, He wants us to share with Him. Even if we're angry, even if we're mad, you know, I've done it, believe me. And it's in the Psalms, you know. People were really angry. You were angry with God. So I'm angry at you, God. It's okay. It's okay. This is He wants us to talk to Him. He wants us to have this relationship. So to answer that question, being grateful and thankful versus praying, reading the Bible, I would say they're all very, very important. Uh, a, quick, uh, a quick answer about that. What's the difference uh, between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant when it comes to actions of the Holy Spirit? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I wondered that myself. You know? <laughs> because we see in the Old Testament where the Holy Spirit did work with people. People are saved. Uh, it seems to be some kind of temporary thing in the Old Testament. And more permanent than the new, but it's still, uh, you know, in many ways it's the same. So, I, yeah, I don't know is the answer. Okay, this one we can answer quickly. What is the church teaching on homosexual marriage? Well, that's a probably a tough question. This was answered before, but let me just say that uh, when this question is asked, usually the expectations of people is you begin with the law. You know, with right, wrong, like look, look at the law. But we are God's people, and we, when we are confronted with a question of how do we deal with this issue or any issue, we have to begin with the very character of God, character of Jesus Christ, which is grace. So from that point of view, we begin first and reveal, and all of us, in any ministry actually, God loves all humanity. And whatever situation we are in, God meets us at that point. Whether whatever sin we are in, God meets us at that point, and He says, "God's a gracious God." But God doesn't leave us there. He doesn't leave us there on our own, because God is relational. From that place He met us in sin and all kinds of situation, God moves us further to a relationship with Him so that we grow into the maturity of Jesus Christ. So therefore, to be able to do that, we have to go through the Scriptures. That is the authority. That is, as Martin Luther says, prima scriptura, we must have a basis for our belief. 
If you don't have a basis for our belief, if there is no authority, if we just try to conjure up our own opinions, then it will be confusion. Then it's going to be just a mess. But we Christians believe in the Word of God through the Scriptures. And from Genesis to Revelation, understanding first of all that God's a gracious God, okay? But from Genesis to Revelation, we see that God created humanity as gender, male and female. And we look from Genesis to Revelation that God used this to give glory to Him. In fact, it says in the image of you know, the image of humanity kind of reflect who God is. There is a certain something about the male and female that gives glory to God. In fact, when we look at even the prophets, there's so many scriptures in Hosea, for example, where God used this relationship between man and woman, where God and Israel is like a husband and wife. Then when we go into Jesus Christ, again, that example of Jesus Christ is the husband and the, and the church is the wife. So God has used the gender biblical basis, not only for procreation. I mean, that's another topic to talk about, that if, if there is no male and female, there will be no human beings, right? Uh, but God used that in a deeper spiritual level where it pictures who God is. It pictures the relationship between God and humanity and, and also the church. If you mess that up, and if you totally remove gender, then it totally messes up that beautiful picture of God. So what does the church teach on homosexual marriage? We begin with grace and understand that all men have fallen short of the glory of God. And so sometimes the problem is we try to make the sin worse than any other sin. But as Brian says, all sins, you know, it's all against God. But Christ has made provision, has forgiven. But then looking at the scriptures, uh, we do not teach in homosexual uh, marriage as far as uh, the church is concerned. But we have a lot of grace. We have a lot of understanding in, you know, in dealing with this situation. But we do not compromise also what the Bible says. It's too quick an answer, right? <laughs> okay, that's basically time. So thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you have some more questions, we are after church during our potluck, we can talk. Okay.